keep me from making an ass of myself. Anyways, uh, welcome everyone to this, the August 2020 Michigan Unix Users Group meeting. Uh, my host, I'm your host, Craig Maloney. Uh, I will be guiding you through the, the tepid waters of, uh, of this group. Uh, please, if you would, uh, mute yourselves and mute your cell phone and other cellular type devices and noise makers. Uh, while you may appreciate the ringtone, some of us might not. So uh, please mute them. I'd like to introduce our board members. Uh, we have Lazaro, Carlos Carroll, James Heiss, Craig Maloney, Jim McQuillan, Dave Satwitz, and Justin Triplett. And we also have Sharon Kawani, who's our board member emeritus. Jim Gluting, who's also our board member emeritus. And Richard Williams, who's our treasurer and also handles all of our memberships. I'd like to welcome anyone who's here for the first time. If anyone's here for the first time and would like to introduce themselves, uh, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, if you mouse over the window of everyone's uh, smiling countenances and then hit the little raise hand thing, uh, you'll, I'll at least know that someone is out there. Um, if not, well, Mad Dog, yes, definitely. Uh, <laughs> introduce yourself, or if you'd like to wait a little bit, that would be fine as well. In, in, in consideration of time, we'll just wait. Okay, no worries. All right. Well, if you are here for the first time, uh, feel free. We welcome you very much. Uh, hope you come back for our next meeting, which is every second Tuesday of the month. We've been having them online. Love to have you. Dave, would you like to talk a little bit about membership, please? Sure. I would love to talk about membership. Uh, we, we, we sort of go through this every month, at least when we're uh, meeting in person in a library room and have the expense of the library. And uh, we are an open um, organization. Uh, everybody is welcome at every meeting, whether you're a member or not. It's actually a requirement of the library that uh, people be able to come without paying anything. And, uh, when we haven't met at the library, that's still our policy. Um, and we we have a, an opportunity for people to uh, sign up to be a member and be a dues-paying member. That is a little bit in, uh, in flux right now since we don't have, I mean, the main reason for having a membership fee is that we have the expense of the library room that we have to defray. And um, right now, uh, we don't have that expense, so... Uh, you know, we don't really have uh, a huge, huge need for uh, people to pay a membership fee. Although, you know, we're we're all hoping that someday we're back to something close to the old normal, and we we are meeting in person, and uh, we we dearly love to keep our membership rolls up. So, uh, if, if you can, if if you uh, and, and would be willing to, we'd uh, we'd love for you to. It's fifty dollars a year uh, for a membership, and uh, sign up. Uh, you can use PayPal to do that. You can go to mug.org and, and uh, sign up through PayPal. Uh, if you're in any kind of financial stress at all, then uh, you know the, the whole board would just like to encourage you to defer and, and you know take care of whatever else you need to take care of. Uh, we're going to do just fine until we're back to a, a normal kind of situation. But we, we do want to keep our membership up and. Uh, keep the rolls up and stuff like that. So, um, uh, you know, mug.org, you can pay, you can uh, use PayPal to, to, to join if, uh, if you'd like to, and if we can, um, we'd love it if you did. Thank you. All right. Uh, we do have a section here for jobs looking for people. Uh, are there any jobs out there that are looking for folks? Let's get my online. Usually, uh, He's, uh, he's yeah, go ahead, uh, muted, it. but he's always got something to say. So the thing I've always got to say is the <laughs> Ford Motor Company is hiring, and we have a need for a lot of smart people. And we really think that this is a good company for you to get uh, involved in. We're trying to be a real, you know, uh, real company that is sensitive to people and all that type of thing. We've had uh, a change to our CEO uh, this past week. That made uh, big news here, but the, the the mission is the same and the feeling is the same, and we have these uh, very um, powerful um, set of policies and things like that. So we're trying to make this an easy thing for people to uh, work in. Uh, so go to Ford.com, go way down the bottom, it's careers, 
and there's a way you can like select which region and stuff and uh, find out what's going on in terms of the, the job that you want to have. Okay, give that a shot. Excellent, thank you, Gib. Anybody else looking, uh, any other jobs looking for folks? Well, let's turn that around then. Are there any people that are looking for jobs? And keep in mind, we are streaming and I don't have a way to stop the streaming at the moment. So <laughs> just, just to be aware of that. Everybody's working. Everybody's gainfully employed or, or very afraid of saying anything on the internet. So, yeah. yeah, just just retired. So that's yeah. okay. Or you yeah. know, if you, if you are looking for a job, by all means, head on over to our discuss mailing list and uh, post on there. I uh, love to see folks getting gainfully employed, especially in this wonderful time that we're in. We do have comment cards. Um, I'm going to create a link as soon as I uh, remember to do so. I'll post the link in the chat window. We do generally have things such as. Um, you know what the topic is based on our needs uh the topic was not relevant or very relevant presentation and delivery is probably going to be awesome so i won't even give you any other selections for that and i learned something new uh we do we don't have binary here we are definitely about the gradient between no and or yes so feel free to do that um we don't necessarily have topics for future meetings on the comment card but we will um share some of our upcoming topics in october we have uh jim Yes, we have my good friend Scott Belknaves is going to uh, give us a presentation on OpenVPN. Sweet. He's using it in a, in a, he works for the government up in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and he's done a lot with it lately. So he's going to be telling us all about OpenVPN. Sweet. So that should be good. Uh, that's October, I uh, forget that, what, 13th or something like that? I forget the yeah. actual date. Um, yeah. September, we don't have uh, we don't have that one filled in yet. Uh, I've got a couple of feelers out for people, with, and I'm not getting responses back. But um, hopefully, we'll have that ironed out soon. Cool. Uh, and we're working on a couple other things for November, December, onward. Excellent. Every month. Every month. Keep doing Every this. Every single month. <laughs> yeah. Uh, over in the comments section, we have uh, thoughts that you can put in there about the, um, the presentation, other ideas for the group, et cetera. Uh, feel free to be completely free form there. And also ideas for future topics. Again, every month we have other topics that, uh, that we'd like to have presented to you, and uh, we'd like you to have some input in that. So if you have any ideas for future topics that you'd like to see, or better yet, if you have folks that you know are just itching to come and talk to us about something, uh, feel free to put that in there. Um, you can also put your name on there. That would be helpful. And an email address. And you can also select on here if you want to be subscribed to the announced mailing list. It's low traffic. Uh, but that will allow you to get information about upcoming meetings and any other important matters uh, related to maybe, you know, the library reopening or other wonderful mm -hmm. things like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what, uh, yeah, go I'm ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Do we have uh, – what's the latest news from the library? Have they said they're closed at least through October? Is that what I heard? I, my understanding was – and I'm trying to remember what I wrote. It was definitely through September, probably October, and I'm not hopeful for it reopening anytime soon. Um, yeah, probably not this year even. That is that is where I think we're at. Yeah. On that yeah. happy note, I'd like to thank our sponsors for this meeting. <laughs> we have Averis. PenguinCon, Altair, and A2 Hosting, they're all helping make this meeting possible. And I'd also like to thank our media partners, No Starch Press, Inform IT, and Manning. There are some coupons on our website if you'd like to check out and see if there's uh, some good deals on electronic and other media. Um, so definitely check out our website under the Sponsors tab. And uh, thanks very much to No Starch, Inform IT, and Manning for making this awesome as well. I'd like you to stay connected with us, if you would, please, in a night and tidy fashion. Uh, you can visit our website over at mug.org. And then you can also head on over to our next meeting uh, site. You know, if you head on over there, you can find additional meetings and such. And you can also find our Topics Trello Board. So if you click on over where it says meetings and click on down to Topics Trello Board, you'll find all sorts of information about topics and other sort of things where you can suggest new topics, vote on suggested topics, uh, vote on speakers. Um, so these are folks that have suggested topics to us, like to really see something. We'll definitely get that up and going. 
Uh, also topics looking for speakers. Again, uh, those that get voted on, we move those over to this column. So you can find out which ones have got, you know, hotter than others and see if we can find some more stuff for that. And then our scheduled topics as well. This generally speaking has all the latest and greatest information before it gets to the website. So checking on over that and also the uh, column over here for presented topics and such. You can also connect with us via other ways. You can uh, subscribe via the old fashioned mailman way. Head on over to the announced mailing list. There's links over and connect with us um, on the site. You can subscribe to the discuss mailing list, which is general topics uh, related to open source and other and Unix and other assorted things. So head on over there for, for great discussions. You can watch our videos on YouTube. Uh, I also post them up on PeerTube as well because that's just how I am. You can join our get together and meet up groups as well, um, where you can RSVP and find out late, the latest information about upcoming meetings and follow any of our other social media on the contact us page. It's wild. Anyways, uh, there are other groups in the area as well, uh, like such as MD Log, which I think just had their meeting this past weekend, right, Gib? Well, that is correct, um, yes. <laughs> and so uh, MD Log, if you go to mug.org and look up the banner at the top, there's a thing about the groups. If you go down a couple, you can see it right here. It says Metro Detroit Linux User Group, second Saturday of every month at noon Eastern time. And um, so this next meeting, if you went to the website, you see it's Pat Baker going to do a song and dance or something. I, I guess that just means nobody reads the description of what we are going to do. Uh, so anyway, Pat Baker is... Uh, a wonderful uh, person with all kinds of technical knowledge, uh, you know, just a, a fabulous uh, speaker. You want to, you know, show up for that. That's uh, that'll be September twelfth at noon. Excellent. Uh, Simco, what's going on over there? Oh, hello. Uh, since uh, Richard Jackson isn't here, I'll say a few words about. He is here. He just popped oh. on. Yeah. Oh, he just popped on. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead, Richard. Yeah, if you're. Uh, uh, there is unmute yourself. Richard? Oh, he's still muted. Let me go ahead. Uh, oh, there he is. Yeah. Go ahead, Richard. I uh, guess I assume you're talking about meeting topics. Uh, Bates has not been set, but we were talking about getting uh, presenters on PowerShell. Uh, well, Wolf was going to talk about the, the next day browser history uh, once they get that nailed down. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there are a couple other things that uh, slipped out of my mind right now that we're working on. No worries. And where are we head to, uh, to find out more information? Uh, yes. If you go to the, uh, in a few days, if you go to semco.org, S E M C O.org, uh, Next month's topic will be there, and also uh, near the bottom, uh, future topics that we're working on. Awesome. Thank you. You can find also other additional uh, information about other groups on the page. Um, also, head on over to Get Together. There's a few other groups uh, that have made their presence known over there. So head on over there, gettogether.community, and learn more. Uh, Miscellany. Usually we let you know where the bathrooms are. Hopefully you'll be able to do on your own. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there any other business that I'm missing that I have somehow spaced upon? Uh, I think we're good. I think we're good. Okay. Uh, please make sure your trades are in the upright and locked position. Uh, also, please make sure that your telephone and other communication devices that may make noise during the meeting are either muted or yourself, you yourself are muted. And with that, I would like to introduce John Mad Dog Hall, uh, of course, our main speaker for the night. Uh, I don't know if he needs any introduction, but uh, so I won't be able to give him a proper introduction. But John, if you would please uh, introduce yourself and let us know what's going sure. on. Thank you. Sure. I have some slides. Can you hear me all? Yeah. Okay. I have some slides I'm going to put up there, mostly to keep myself on track. Um, it's, it's a little bit of the personal history of me with free software and Unix systems in general. So I'm going to put uh, my application window up and share that with you. Perfect. 
Okay. There you go. Okay. I've got it up there. You can see it. There we go. Okay. So this is a personal history, but it is tied in with free software. And, uh, oops, how am I? Oh, there we go. First of all, I need to remind everybody that Linux is a registered trademark of Linus Torvalds in several countries around the world. We actually administer that through the Linux Mark Institute, which now is under the guidance of the Linux Foundation. Uh, and Unix is a registered trademark of the Open Group. And with by, by passing tests, you can brand your operating system as a true Unix system, no matter what SCO says. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to take you way back in time, around the time that I started with software, which is about 1969. And at that time, most software was what we would call today open source. But we didn't call it open source because we just you know, measure memories in kilobytes and stuff like that, and very expensive. So you might pay fifty thousand dollars for a system that only had. 4,000 12-bit words of memory. Um, if there was an operating system on the computer, it was pretty specialized. And typically what you did was you compiled your programs and you linked in the device drivers into your program, and then you booted your program and that ran on the computer. And one of the first computers that I programmed or the first computer I programmed was an IBM 1130. That's a picture of it right there. Um, it ran one program at a time. You had a console that you could type things in on. You had some sense switches that you could flip up and down and that could control your program. Uh, you had lots of lights showing you what was in the registers and stuff like that. And uh, I programmed that in Fortran notice the spelling of Fortran, all capital letters, because, I mean, obviously, what other language might you ever need other than Fortran? And not Fortran to do Fortran. stuff to create this contract for writing the software. And there were very few professional programmers back in those days. They, I mean, if you were in computers, it's because you were a physicist or a chemist or a mathematician or something like that. In fact, I even had a professor tell me one time, John, you're never going to be able to learn to earn a living being a professional programmer. And I'm still trying to find out if he was right or not. I still have a few years, you know. I might completely fail as a programmer. I don't know. So after you did all this, typically the software belonged to you because you paid for it. And so you could decide, well, I don't want the guy that wrote this thing for me originally to do it because he did a crappy job. I'm going to hire somebody else to fix bugs in it, to extend it for me and stuff like that because I own the software. And some software was even what we would call free software today. It was uh, written by people who were not 
professional programmers. Uh, and uh, they would belong to groups like DECAS, the Digital Equipment Corporation User Society, or SHARE, which is IBM's uh, thing, or Brainstorm, that was Novell's thing. And these were user groups who had specific interests. Sometimes they had meetings and stuff like that, big conventions. Uh, DECAS would typically have two conventions a year. There could be as many as 19,000 people showing up at a DECAS convention. Um, and they would publish these catalogs, paper catalogs, that you would send away $15 to get a copy of this. Now, this is $15 back in 1969. This is a lot of money to get this paper catalog in the mail. And then you look through the catalog to see what computer system the software was for, description of what it did, stuff, and what media you would get it on, whether it's paper tape or magnetic tape or whatever. And then you would send it away, and it was maybe it's $5 for a small paper tape for something like a text editor or something, or $15 for an assembler to assemble PDP-8 assembly language, you know, into some, some program. But people would write this and contribute it to DECAS, and DECAS would then manage the software, print the catalog, and when you send in your money, we make a copy of the software to give to you. Now, the thing was that this was, in effect, free software because, again, there was no copyright or patents or something applied to it. So as a college student, even though $5 was a lot of money, I'd say, hey, $5, man. I mean, that's three pitchers of beer. And so... I had a choice of three pitchers of beer or a text editor for the PDPA computer that you can see right there in the picture. Uh, that's an ASR33 teletype with it, and it has a reader punch for paper tape on it that could read or write at five characters or approximately five bytes per second. And you say, you know, five dollars, three pitchers of beer, but once I had that paper tape, I could go to the school store, I could buy some new paper tape make copies of it, and then sell it to my roommates for a dollar a copy. And after I made 10 copies, I bought the text editor, I had bought, you know, paid for the new paper tape, and I made another $5 that I could go and have my pictures of beer. And so this was great, you know. I mean, I was the first Red Hat, you know. And people would say, well, this software wasn't written by professionals, right? It was written by amateurs. Well, we have to really take a look at professionals, you know, like professional baseball players, right? I mean, there's a lot of baseball players who are professional baseball players that they're not very, you know, they're not really what most people consider to be athletes. Right? Um, but, you know, there's a lot of amateur baseball players that you know, really good. I mean, particularly if you're in the Olympics or something like that, you're a good player. It's just that the professionals get paid a lot of money to do it. And the same thing for the amateur painters. I mean, there's a lot of painters who are amateur painters and they paint beautiful paintings. It's just they never got into the business of creating paintings that they sell. So I helped to start the Jackson Computer Club and I learned PDP-8 PDP assembly language for that little machine basically by reading a book that was given to me by a DEC salesperson. He had no idea what he was doing or, or you know, how he was helping me along that path, but that path started me down my profession of computer programming. Because up until that point, I was studying how to be an electrical engineer. And... I went to work at the Western Electric plant. That was the wire cable making plant for the Bell System in Baltimore, Maryland. We made enough wire to go to the moon and come back seven times every day. And um, I was almost electrocuted by 13,600 volts and 800 amps. And it was at that moment that I realized that I really wanted to go into software because the worst thing that could happen is you get a paper cut. And not only that, but you could do your work in a nice air-conditioned office, low humidity. It was just perfect. So I 
kind of changed my curriculum from being an electrical engineer over to programming. So also in 1969, a few other things happened. Uh, Unix was started, Bell Labs in New Jersey. The internet was started, you know. Uh, Linus Torvalds was born in Helsinki, Finland, and I shaved for the last time. So all of those things happened in 69. Now, some problems did exist. It wasn't all cream and peaches. Uh, it was really expensive to give a, a student a computer and very heavy. Uh, sometimes if you gave a student a computer, they needed to have a raised floor in the computer center and a 20 ton air conditioner and water cooling and an 18 wheeler tractor trailer truck to haul it home and all that type of stuff. And communication was by snail mail or carrying boxes of cards down the hallway um, or later on using something like UUCP to dial up a bulletin board or dial up another system and communicate with a 130 or 300 baud modem, which does about 30 characters a second or 30 bytes a second. So, you know, things are a little slow. Um, I graduated and went to work for Aetna Life and Casualty, a large insurance company in Hartford, Connecticut. It was the world's largest multi-line insurance company in the world. That building is just their data center. And it actually went down another four floors underground. It was the largest commercial user of IBM equipment in the free world. So we didn't know what the Russians had or the Chinese had. And we didn't know what the military had, and we didn't know what the government had. But if it was a commercial user, car company or whatever, they were second or third to us. And uh, we had a tape library that had 500,000 nine-track tapes inside, on site. We had a mainframe IBM computer that was its sole function was to keep track of where those tapes were. We had another 100,000 nine track tapes in a salt mine in Idaho for long-term storage. We had, uh, we even had tape drives in bubble wrap in the salt mine to read some of those tapes. Now, don't ask me where the operating system was to read them or the hardware, to, the CPU to plug them in to read them was. So that was a different subject, but we would actually take a tape drive and, you know, as they came out, put one in that salt mine so that in case we ever had to read those tapes, we could. Um, we had in, on one system, we had 500 IBM 3330 disk drives that represented one file on one program on one system. We had 500 disks. And I actually had to write the device driver for that because IBM didn't have 500 disk drives that they could just set aside for writing device drivers and testing device drivers. So I had to take their device driver and make it work on that system because we had the 500 disk drives. Um, I will also say that those disk drives cost $32,000 a piece in 1975. About the same time, my parents bought a three-bedroom house, all brick, living room, dining room, family room, full basement, mother-in-law garage, apartment and stuff, for $32,000 in Baltimore, Maryland, brand new. So you can see how much money that Aetna was spending on their computer equipment. And we wrote the first online real-time transaction processing system in the world where people could actually type in the data at their different terminals spread across the United States and it would go through a go through a process go through a transaction and update the database in real time you know not batch or anything like that in real time we wrote it it was called the claims and it was the first one in the world and of all this stuff, we had the sources for it. We had the sources for all of IBM's 
operating systems. We had the sources for the compilers. You know, if we bought software, we got the sources for it. Because if you didn't want to give us the sources, then you didn't have to sell us the software and we didn't have to buy it. And We had you know, 128 kilobytes of core. Number one, we hey, upgraded hey, that to Hey, John. Kilobytes. John, yeah. can I stop you for a sec? Uh, for sure. the last so, 30 or 40 seconds, uh, the audio got really, really choppy. I think the last uh, thing, the last thing intelligible that we heard was about the, having the source code for uh, for all the programs that you had in house. Okay. Uh, uh, and some of the people have asked that, that maybe you could repeat some of that since then. Sure. Sure. Uh, sorry about that. Any, uh, uh, anybody who's still got their camera turned on, uh, please turn it off. Uh, that'll reduce the bandwidth requirements. Uh, Victor, that includes you and Richard and uh, uh, Dick Williams. If you can, although Dick is away from us chair right now but that'll reduce the bandwidth requirements and hopefully the audio will stay better um because it, it's been pretty good other than when you first started talking we had a few seconds of choppiness uh but it had been good for quite a while okay uh, okay so having said that john if you could kind of pick it up from that slide where you were talking about the, the last bullet item was uh that you had the source code right so to give you an to give you an example of why we needed the source code for this, uh, we purchased a compiler for the system because the commercial compiler that we purchased gave us 10% better performance than the compilers that we got from IBM. And if you pay two and a half million dollars for an opera for a computer and you get 10% better performance out of it. That means, in effect, you save $250,000. So paying $100,000, and remember, these are $1975, paying $100,000 for your copy of this compiler was a good deal. And we, we did a contract for the compiler, which said, you know, how do we accept it? And what documentation do we get with it? And all of a sudden, one day, this engineer shows up with this nine track tape. He spends a week there getting the compiler to work on our system and running the tests and everything to show it did what it was supposed to do. 
And then he left. We kept the tape and we put it into escrow in case something should happen to that little company or we needed to get some type of fix. And this is just the way things happened when you were at a life and casualty uh, back in those days. I, I loved that, that. It was a great place to work, but I also wanted to go teach. And I got my uh, master's degree at night from the Harvard Graduate Center in Hartford, Connecticut. It was a branch of Harvard. And I went to talk, I went to teach at Hartford State Technical College. Um, their department head had had to retire because he had had a couple heart attacks. He was like a type A personality. And his doctor he kept working at the school, it was going to kill him. So he went off and I took over as a professor, but then became department head. And um, they had a very nice system there. It was a DEC PDP 1170 running a Vistas E operating system that was uh, mostly used for educational things. Uh, you can see the configuration that we had there. Uh, they also had a PDP 1134 with a graphics tube and a light pen. And uh, it had eight inch floppy disk drives. And then we had this big Gerber flatbed plotter that could draw you know, diagrams and stuff using, believe it or not, Gerber files, the same Gerber files we use today for 3D printing and uh, CAD work and stuff like that. It turns out that uh, Gerber Scientific, who created the Gerber files, was a company that was only a few miles away from Harvard State Tech, and that often they would take some of our uh, students when they graduated and hire them to work at Gerber. So Gerber had a great deal of, of, of interest in our little two-year college. Uh, and once again, I got involved with DECAS because I wanted to have software that I could show my students, that my students could use. And because we were a state university, we didn't have a lot of money. So going to DECAS, we could get the, the software and put it on our system and get it to work and stuff like that. And, you know, I got more involved with Dika's again. I also tried ordering Unix. Now, everybody keeps saying how Unix was open and Unix was free and Unix was, you know, easy to get for universities. I'm going to temper that somewhat. If you were a research university, like University of California, Berkeley, or Carnegie Mellon, or Columbia, or Purdue, or Duke. Yes, you could get Unix for $350 for a site-wide license. And of course, they delivered it to you in source code form. However, if you were a company or the military, or a small two-year technical college that did not do research, then the price tag was $160,000 per CPU. <laughs> and you needed to also, besides the check for $160,000, you had to tell them the serial number of the computer system that you were going to put the software on. And if that CPU went down or was broken and you wanted to put it on a different CPU, you had to call them up before you did that and tell them what the other CPU number was so they could update their records and transfer it over. So Unix wasn't exactly free. I know all of this because I tried to get Unix for my little school and I had to give up. So I worked for the school for a couple of years, and, um, and then I had an opportunity to go to work for Bell Laboratories. Bell Laboratories in North Andover, Massachusetts, uh, branch labs that did work with the Western Electric Company there. 
And of course, I've had experience as a co-op student working for the Western Electric Company. My whole family was in telephony and telephone. So I went to work for them and as a Unix systems administrator. Now, I'd never seen a Unix system before. And the systems I had seen use basically what you might call a flat file system, not a hierarchical file system, but a flat file system with a directory structure and files underneath. No directories of directories of directories, just a directory, the disk number, a directory, and the files. So that was a kind of a shock. And then the other thing that was a shock were these hundreds of little commands that, you know, there was just gazillions of them. And the other thing that was kind of a shock was that you had one directory called slash bin, and that heralded a certain number of commands, and there's another directory that had slash user bin, and then there was another directory that was slash home slash some type of username slash bin. And how did all these things fit together? And there was this thing called an environment and all this stuff. And I was just thrown into the middle of this to say, okay, you're now our Unix systems administrator. And fortunately, I had a couple guys who were temporary systems administrators to help me along with this a little bit. And I was and I'm a relatively fast learner. And so eventually I took over and ran the whole uh, computer division or computer group there at Bell Labs. But most of this, the thing that, that I really loved about it was because we developed Unix, I had all the source code. And I also had access to some of the people who were some of the main developers of Unix. And we would go to in internal Unix meetings of Western Electric and Bell Labs and stuff and talk things over and stuff. I submitted a lot of bug fixes to the system. Uh, one, one, one particular group of bug fixes I gave was to the split command because the split command would take a large file and break it up into lots of little files uh, automatically going from AA to AB to AC all the way up to ZZ, and then running out of letters, it would start to go into numbers and then special characters. And unfortunately, it would continue to go until it hit Control U, which, when it generated Control U, in effect, it wiped out everything else that it had just done. And I thought this was kind of a bug. <laughs> so I went into the command and, and said, you know, Obviously, the, the, the person who's creating all these files probably made a mistake. And so if they were going to generate that many files, I gave a warning message and said, you know, you, you, may, have, you, you may want to do something else here. And, and the other thing was that I commented the whole program because the program had no comments in it at all. I had to study the code. I had to figure out what it was doing. And then, so I said, well, this is, this is really hard. I'm going to put in comments. So I put in all these comments. And I submitted it to the Bell Labs group in New Jersey. And in the next release, they used my code. And they said, well, you know, this is a really crappy fix, really. Um, we'll do a much better job later on. Thank you, guys. Um, but the other thing I noticed was that they had stripped out all the comments again. And um, so the next release came and my code was still there. And the next release came and my code was still there. And as far as I know, they never did fix it the way they thought it should be fixed. So that's okay. About that time, different companies decided that they were going to do a commercialization of Unix, and particularly a little company called Sun Microsystems. They were starting off with a single board computer that was developed at Stanford University. It was a very powerful little workstation type of computer. And what they were looking for was an operating system that could really take advantage of the hardware. 
you know, things like CPM were too weak and miserable. Um, this thing done by this company called Microsoft, whoever they were, MS-DOS, was also weak and miserable. They wanted to either do, like, they, they wanted VMS. They came to DAC and they, they talked with Ken Olson to say, could they buy the source code to license VMS to put on this little system? And Ken said, no, no, no. You know, he had a different vision for VMS. That probably would have been a mistake anyway because a lot of VMS was written in a high-level assembly language called Bliss. So it would have been a lot of, lot of work to work. And then eventually they talked with Bill Joy of Berkeley, and they said, oh, Berkeley Unix. Yeah, let's put that on there. And when they did that, they had to somehow get around this $160,000 fee per CPU. And what they did was they said, okay, uh, we're only going to put this out in binary. We're not going to expose the source code of your operating system. If we do only binaries, would you make the licensing less? And, oh, by the way, can we forget about the serial numbers? And AT&T said, sure. We'll make the license fee instead of $160,000. $350 and no serial number. And that was fine for its son because they were going to be selling their system for $20,000 or so. You know, so $350 was fine for the operating system. But they didn't take System 3 or System 4 or System 5. They went with Berkeley. And that was a good, good choice. We'll see a little bit later. About the same time, PCs were happening. Altair, ZADC, you know, all it, IBM, PC, all these lower price systems were starting to happen and computer stores started to appear and people started to buy computers, you know, by the hundreds. About that time, I decided to leave Bell Labs and go to work for Digital Equipment Corporation, a company I respected for a long time. Um, I went into their beginning deck group. They had been supporting Berkeley Unix and AT&T Unix on PDP-11s and faxes, but they were not putting out a product. You went to AT&T to get your license, and then you went to Berkeley or AT&T to get your, your code to put on our systems. Um, so they decided they were going to put out their own version of Unix for PDB-11s and their own version of Unix for faxes. And they, you know, and then later on, MIPS processors. Um, and then later on after that, the alpha system, which we went with a different piece of code, one that was based on Carnegie Mellon's mock microkernel. And we called it, it was called OSF1 was part of the original output from the Open Software Foundation. And then later on, we renamed that into True64 because it was a 64-bit system. Now, we have to go back a little bit in time because remember 1980, 1981, 1983 or so, Unix started to turn from being something you would get in source code form into this binary-only distribution. And that was when Richard Stallman formed the GNU project and then later on formulated the Free Software Foundation to go and generate GNU code. And I met Richard for the first time in 1986. I took down an Ultrix back system to him so he could put GNU code onto that. And believe me, I could tell you lots of stories about Richard. And the more beer you put into me, the more stories I tell. <laughs> so about this point, I really stress to people what free software means. It's not free as in beer, but it's free as in freedom. And there's a lot of people that are confused between open source and free software. Open source like the BSD license or the MIT license or the artistic license or all those. Those are good for 
the developer. They tell the developer that if you have this license on the source code, you can take that source code, and if you follow the license, you can produce a product from that. And you can produce that product as a, you know, as a as a binary product, you don't have to put out this, the, the source. You don't have to put out your changes. You don't have to tell anybody really what's there, other than you got the code from MIT, you got the code from BSD. You don't have to pass on the freedoms that you got to the end users. Richard Stallman wanted to make sure that the end user had the same freedoms as the developer. And so he created the GPL, the free software license, that technically speaking is open source, but it's open source on steroids. About that time, I'm still back at DEC. We're still putting out digital Unix. And we had a bunch of customers that said, I really want to take this GNU software and have it on digital Unix, have it on the alpha system. And I have 300 systems, and I really don't want to compile it and get it to work. DAC, would you do this for me? And a lot of product managers that we had didn't think that this was an interesting project. They didn't think we could make any money on it and stuff. So they said, no. And I said, you know, we're not going to be able to sell our systems if we don't do that. So I put together a team of about three engineers, and we created a little CD that we called Good Stuff. And it was all, all the free software that we could find. All we had to do was compile it, put it, into, put it on the CD. And then we gave these CDs out at trade shows, and they, were, they just loved them. They were the, easily the best swag in the show. So in 1994, in about January, no, in November of 1993, actually, in November of 1993, Dr. Dobbs Magazine, Dr. Dobbs Journal of Computer Calisthenics and Orthodontia, as it was called formerly, had an article about a Unix operating system complete with sources that you could get for $99. And I'm reading this, and I said, a Unix operating system with sources for $99. Now, I thought this was kind of strange, because if you wanted to get the source code for digital Unix, you had to pay, you had to go to AT&T still and get an AT&T source code license and it was still $160,000. And then you went to digital, and you got their source code license for digital Unix, and that was $35,000. And then you got the source code distribution, which was $1,200. And then you had the source code. And how could Dr. Dobbs put out a Unix operating system with sources for only $99? And I also knew, at the same time that this was going on, that there was this little company called BSDI that was being sued by Unix Systems Labs for putting out a source code copy of Unix. And how could Dr. Dobbs Magazine do this? So I took my $99, I sent it off to them, and a couple weeks later, I get this thin little book in the mail, along with a CD, and it had the operating system and all the source code on it. And this is great, except I didn't have an Intel PC to run this on. I had real computer systems. I had faxes. I had MIPS. I had alphas. I didn't have one of these weak, miserable, crappy Intel PCs to put this operating system on. So I couldn't see what it was like. But what I could do was mount it on Altrix and look 
at what was there and I could read the man pages and stuff like that. I says, hey, this kind of looks interesting, but I put everything back and put it in my filing cabinet and forgot about it. So a couple months later, a friend of mine by the name of Kurt Riesler, who worked with Dicus, he was the president of the Unix Special Interest Group uh, at Dicus, he started sending out these email messages about this young guy from Europe who worked in this project, and he wanted to bring him to Dicus in New Orleans. And he would write to these little companies, and for some reason he always copied me on his mail. And the little companies would say, well, you know, we're just a small company. We don't have much money, but we could give you some CDs to hand out to your members. And after a while, I went to my bosses, and I said, I don't know who this guy is or what he did, but sometimes Kurt has good ideas, and I think we should fund this. And my bosses went to their bosses and said, we don't know who this guy is or what he did, and we don't know who Kurt is, but sometimes Mad Dog has good ideas, and we think that we should fund this. And so we got about $5,000 and bought a hotel and paid for his airline tickets. And then Kurt asked the unforgivable. He asked for a PC to run the software on. And I just exploded at him. I said, Kurt, I don't sell PCs. I sell real computers like Vaxes and MIPS and Alphas. I don't sell PCs. I need one, I need one. Okay. Got him a PC, and I flew down to New Orleans. Now, if you guys, I'm sure that some of you have been to New Orleans. It is one of two adult Disneylands in the United States. One of them is Las Vegas, and the other is the French Quarter of New Orleans. It's one of my favorite cities. And so I flew down there, and there was Kurt trying to put this software on this PC and not being very successful, when all of a sudden along comes this nice young man with sandy brown hair, wire rimmed glasses, wearing wool socks with sandals, and says, can I help you? And Kurt looks at him, smiles, and says, yes, I think you can. And within about 10 minutes, Linux was on that PC. That was the first time that Linus Torvalds had ever installed Linux from a CD-ROM. Because the way he installed Linux was he had two disks in his PC, he built the distribution on one disk, booted that disk, and installed it onto the second disk. That's how he did it. He didn't even have a CD-ROM <laughs> CD reader on his system. So they asked me to sit down and, you know, and uh, try it out, and it was great. And I started to think about, at that moment, trying to convince Linus to port Linux onto an alpha system, to take it from being 32-bit to 64-bit, and from a CISC system into a RISC system, to make it more portable, and to create something which people could do computer science research on. Something where when you did your research, you could actually publish your sources and not just write a white paper about what you're doing. And that's why I wanted him to put Linux on the alpha. And so, actually, I'll go back to the previous picture. I took him out on that riverboat, the Natchez, and the Natchez is the, is the last of the steam-driven paddle wheelers going up and down the Mississippi. They have a steam calliope. They serve a great buffet. And they give you these wonderful drinks called hurricanes. And the reason they call them hurricanes is that after you've had two of them, you feel like you've been hit by Katrina. And we had a great dinner. We're standing on the bow of the boat going down the river. It's night. And I said to Linus, Linus, have you ever thought about 
importing Linux to a 64-bit computer like the Alpha? He says, yes, yes, I thought about that, but the DEC office in Helsinki has been having problems getting me an Alpha, so I may have to do the IBM Power PC instead. <laughs> and I dropped my hurricane, and I never drop a drink. And I said, don't do anything rash. So I went running back to my office the next day. I called up a friend of mine, and I said, I need a favor. I don't have the time to tell you who this guy is, or what he's done, or anything about it. But you have to send an alpha computer system to Helsinki, Finland, right away on the Lunar Products. In fact, even before the Lunar Products is done, you have to send a system. You have to start it going right now. He sent a system that was worth 30,000 US dollars back in 1994, basically on my recommendation. And it got to Linus's house three days before the IBM PowerPC got there. And Linus said, because it got there three days ahead, he didn't turn on the PowerPC for a year. <laughs> and IBM called him up about every month. Have you turned on the PowerPC yet? No, not yet. So finally, he turned it on and turned it off just so he could tell him he had turned it on. But by that time, he'd already been looking at the alpha. He already knew about the architecture. He was very interested in it. And so we put together a small team of deck people who had also been looking at different operating systems for the alpha. They had thought about doing a 32-bit port instead of a 64-bit port. And I convinced them that that was the wrong answer. Because not only was the alpha incredibly fast, but having a 64-bit implementation of Linux would mean that you could do some very interesting things in software that was just very difficult to do with a 32-bit computer. As an example, you could map in an entire simulation of a Boeing 747 airplane, not just one time but every six months of its entire life. You could map in the Lord of the Rings in the equivalent of 70 millimeter film, the entire movie into one address space. You could do things, you could map weather, you could map you know, just huge problems a lot easier than working with a very small address space. When I say small, Four billion bytes is small. And so while this system was working its way to Linus in Helsinki, I was emailing Linus uh, documentation so he could look at it. And like I said, he did not turn on the IBM PowerPC for a year. He started the port in January of 1995 because he wanted to fill up. He went to complete version 1.2. He wanted to get 1.2 out the door with bug fixes and stuff. And by November of 1995, Red Hat had put out a distribution of GNU Linux Alpha. Um, there was a company in Boston, still there, called Eli Heffern and Sons. They would take Alpha systems that people were wanted to sell. And they would take them and pull out the memory and pull out the deck memory and pull out the deck drives, just leaving the CPU there, and sell the very expensive uh, memory and the very expensive drives to other people. So when you went there, there was just a bunch of alpha systems sitting there with no memory, no CPU, all that type of stuff. After the Linux, project started, I went to Eli Heffern and Sons to see if I could get an alpha system to help with the project, and all the alphas were gone. And I said to him, what happened to all the alphas? He says, I don't know. These guys come running in here, mumble something about lines, get the alpha, put memory and disk drives in it, and leave. He says, they're all buying. What is a Linux? And some of these people actually bought alpha systems with their own money 
to help with the project, particularly Richard Henderson, who was a student at Texas A&M University working on compilers. He created shared libraries for Alpha Linux. And David Mossberger Tang, he was the one who did um, the SANE scanner, mm -hmm. the scanner software for SANE and XSANE. And he also worked on certain libraries, putting certain libraries. Really, really great guys. Um, a little story about the DEC math library. We had a math library, you know, sine, cosine, tangent, all that type of stuff. And we had hired a mathematician to make the world's fastest math library for digital units. And it was just blazingly fast. The Linux people wanted us to contribute the library to them in source code form. We were happy to contribute a binary that would work on Linux, but my management did not want to give out the source code because it said, hey, son would just copy it and then their math library would be as fast as ours. So I was caught between these two groups. You know? And finally, one day I just turned to the Linux people and said, if you guys are such hot shot programmers, why don't you write your own faster library? And there was like silence on the other end of the internet for like three or four days. And then I got this message across that said, sine is 3% faster. Another couple days, cosine is 2.5% faster. And subroutine by subroutine, we went down to the library and they made every single subroutine faster than the DEC Alpha Math Library. All except for one subroutine. And I forget which one it is. But that subroutine never got any faster. And I asked them why. And they said, nobody uses it. <laughs> nobody cares. So as far as I know, it's still not any faster. So by November 1995, the port was finished. I wanted to make like 4,000 CDs of Alpha Linux, you know, Red Hat's distribution, and give them out. Red Hat says, if you do that, nobody will buy it from us. and We need to sell distributions to make money. And so I said, okay, well, what would happen if you made an Intel Linux distribution of the same, basically the same source code? And I could give that out with the message, if you like this, you should buy the Alpha Linux version. It's going to be that much faster, and it'll be 64 bit. And so that's what we did. We made about 4,000 of those. We put the Red Hat logo on there. That was the old Running Man logo and the deck logo. And I started giving these out as I started going around the world to conferences. And I felt just like App Johnny Apple Linux. Not Johnny Apple C, but Johnny Apple Linux. Giving these out and spreading them. I went to Deacus, Australia. And on my way, I stopped off at Honolulu to visit a friend of mine who was going to university there. And I met this guy named Pat Gouda. His father was an ISP. I gave one of the CDs to Pat. He said, oh, this is kind of interesting. We went on down to Adelaide, Australia, and we met with this company called Netcraft, and they were already in the market selling Linux support, along with a guy named Jeffrey Bennett, who was one of the people that worked at Netcraft. And it was Jeffrey who got this whole thing together about the Microsoft tax and trying to get the money for the Microsoft license off of the PC that he had purchased. And eventually he did. He got about $180 back, which is ridiculous because they didn't pay that much. And I'm still friends with Jeffrey. He's, he's a great guy. On the way back, I went to Fiji. And I only had like one CD left. And I stopped off for a little rest in Nadi, a city of Fiji. And I was invited to go to the University of the Pacific there. Now, if you ever want to find a place to retire, the University of Pacific in Fiji is one of them with the big palm trees flying back and forth and 
the professors wear sarongs and go barefoot. And you just have these these bottles of Fiji bitter beer. That's a picture of it there on the table. Just a wonderful place. And uh, I gave them a copy of Linux. And they said, oh, that's wonderful because they've been trying to pull it down over the net, but their modem was so slow in pulling it down that there'd be some type of storm in the South Pacific and the modem line would drop and then they'd have to start all over again. So giving them the CD helped them a lot. I felt a little bit like this. <laughs> so we went to things, some early events like Linux Expo in New York City, and that's uh, right there is, oh, crap, I'm having a mental blank with his name. He's uh, one of the three guys who started Red Hat. Is it uh, Donnie? No, it's not Donnie. It's no. Eric Trowan. Eric Trowan. Oh, okay. Right yeah. there. And you can see in the background their uh, big banner that they had. And oh, they had yeah. some bookshelves with tablecloths on them. Now, in the lower picture, uh, the guy in the red hat in the rocking chair, that's Donnie. Okay. And he has he has uh, Kit Cosper's firstborn son oh. there in his lap. Uh, that kid is now, of course, like, you know, married and has, and has children of his own. Uh, there's Alan Cox. Uh, the guy with the checkered or, or plaid shirt on is um, the other major owner or starter, um, Ewing, uh, Mark Ewing. He's the guy. He's the guy who actually came up with the idea of Red Hat, and that was that was uh, Johnson in the background. Again, I'm having uh, uh, Michael Johnson. Michael Johnson. Yep. Yeah, we we had him speak here. Gosh, like 15 years ago. Yep, and that's Kit Cosper there. Uh, yeah. Kit, Kit started the uh, Linux hardware thing, and then he went on to work with VA Linux Systems and a couple other people there from the early days. Uh -huh. We all slept on people's floors and stuff like that because you know, that, that's all that anybody had any money for. It was a great time. Now, I talked about Pat Goda and how I happened to give a CD to him. He was a roommate of a friend of mine at the University of Hawaii on my way down to Australia. Well, about a year later, all of a sudden, this concept of this thing called Beowulf supercomputers started up. Hmm. And Beowulf supercomputers, of course, took large problems and you decompose them and made them work across a whole bunch of, you know, regular PC class of problems and basically allowed you to create the same type of computing power at 1 40th of what a commercial supercomputer would cost. And I was, you know, looking into this. I thought this was great. And somebody said, well, you really need to talk to this guy named Pat Goda at Los Alamos Labs. And I called him up. I said, Mr. Goda, I'm working. John Hall, I work for Digital Equipment Corporation, and the voice of the other end says, you don't remember me, do you? I'm the one you gave that CD to, and because you gave that CD to me, I used it in all the work I was doing at the university about supercomputers and stuff. I brought that to Los Alamos. That system right there is called Loki, and he was using Loki to simulate what would happen if an asteroid collided into the Earth. And that was what I was calling him up to ask about, was that program, that, that usage of this. Because I gave him that CD for a while, every single national lab used Red Hat <laughs> in creating the Bay of Systems. And, uh, and for a while, I mean, he was using, he was making his asteroids you know, collide into New York City. But then what happened was 9-11, and he switched to having them collide into Los Angeles instead. So that was, you know, another one of those small world things that something you do has great effect. Uh, I went to the University of Sao Paulo in 1996, and they also were using a Beowulf's system. They had 160 computers put together. 
Um, and they were running Linux, of course. And they were doing Toy Story quality graphics in real time, not rendered over a period of time, but in real time. So you stand on a little pedestal with a baton in your hand. As you wave the baton, the little opera singer that the computer created would follow the baton, his chest would puff out, his leak, his, you could see his face turn red if he was supposed to be very loud. And all of this was in real time. He, they were also uh, evaluating mammograms in real time. Uh, they had a program that could determine whether or not a woman had breast cancer that was 95% of the time, it was completely accurate. But it took 20 hours to run this program on a Spark 20 computer system. On their Beowulf system, it only took 10 minutes. And so they could come up with the same answer. And they're, they're, what they wanted to do was spread the program out across all of the computers that were in the hospital that were just sitting there, basically idle, doing nothing, and have each one of those computers do a portion of this program for the mammogram. And they were also using Linux to repair computers across their gigantic campus. They have 100,000 students in Sao Paulo. Uh, it takes about four hours to drive across the city at rush hour, and four hours to get back. So they would install Linux on the other half of the disk drive of their Windows systems. And if Windows would boot, they would boot Linux. That told them the hardware was okay. And then once Linux was up and running, they would FTP a brand new copy of Windows over top of the old one and reboot the system into Windows again. And the president of the university took me out to lunch and looked me in the face and said, Mad Dog, is this a legitimate use of Linux? And I said, Mr. President, every use of Linux is a legitimate use of Linux. Now, that certificate which you see on the screen, you'll notice that it's the 1997 Gordon Bell Award for performance and price for performance for high performing computer systems. Gordon Bell used to work for digital. He was one of the people who helped to develop the PDP 11 and Vista and RSX 11 and also the VAX and VMS. He had left digital and gone to work for Microsoft and was in their high performance computing group. And the interesting thing was that they, they had this prize named after him, but every year the systems that won the prize were running Linux. <laughs> he never, there was never any prize bearing his name that was won with Microsoft. And I asked him one time about it. He kind of laughed. He was a good guy. He didn't care. But uh, I says, Gordon, how's it feel to be working for Microsoft, be the head of this high-performance computing thing, and it's always Linux that wins the prize? Like I said, he just laughed. So I go on another trip. I stop off Fiji again. It's a couple of years later. I say to my salesperson, I'd like to go back to the university and see how they're doing with Linux. And he says, they're not using Linux. I said, well, they seem to be excited about it the last time. He says, nope, nope. They haven't said anything about it. And I would know because I'm the salesman. If they had anything, they would have asked me. So I said, well, let's go and see them anyway. We go to the university. We go into the director's office. I introduce myself, and I notice that on the windowsill there's a plush tux penguin. And I said, Mr. Director, I'm John Hall. I'm the president of Linux International. And uh, I was just wondering, do you guys use Linux here? He said, oh, 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 the professors would all like to talk to you. And so we went out into, the, into this meeting room, and all the professors came in, you know, wearing their sarongs and barefoot and stuff like that. They all sat there, and the, my salesman was sitting right next to me. <coughs> Pardon me. And I said, um, how many of you have Linux on your laptop or your desktop or your server? And all of them raised their hand. 
And my salesman was so surprised, he fell off of his stool. And we got back outside, he said, I don't understand. They didn't say anything to me for two years, nothing about Linux. And I looked at him and I said, that's because they don't need you anymore. <laughs> they have everything they need. And now you're actually going to have to do some work. You're going to have to make yourself useful to them. I probably ruined this whole year. <laughs> so we're getting very close to the end here. And time has passed. Deck was bought by Compaq. Compaq was bought by Hewlett Packard. And I get a note from this guy, David Mossberger Tang, who did the work on the things I told you about. And he said to me, Mad Dog, I still have an alpha system that I got as a loan of products when I was working on alpha. And I don't know who to return it to. I can't return it to Deck because they're gone. I can't return it to Compaq because they're gone. It's, I could return it to somebody at Hewlett Packard, but I don't know who. I says, oh, well, what are you doing now, David? He says, well, I'm actually going to be working for Hewlett Packard in about two weeks. I says, David, just hold on to it, and it'll be back where it belongs. <laughs> and so I asked people, if there was closed source software, could it allow people to do the types of things that these people did. These people I've met, talked with. Of course, Eric Troen is up there in the upper right-hand corner. He's sitting on a robot made by the company called iRobot, which is a Boston-based company. And Linux is used as the operating system to control the motors and everything else in the robots. Their product that they sell, which is closed source, is an artificial intelligence product which gives commands to the operating system to make the robots go. But because their customers want to be able to have the operating system open, they use Linux. The guy in the black and white photograph, he was a college student, and he was running a consulting service out of his university for Linux and free software. And he had he, he realized he needed a PBX system, a private branch exchange, to handle telephone calls and stuff like that. But a PBX system would cost between twenty and thirty thousand dollars and he didn't have the type of money. So he decided he was going to write his own. And he happened to go to an Atlanta Linux showcase meeting in Atlanta, Georgia. And he listened to a talk I was giving about free software. And he realized he had to license the software as free software because if he licensed it as proprietary software, he probably would not get anywhere. And so he licensed his software as free software under the GPL, and he called it Asterisk. His name is Mark Spencer. And he later on sold the company Digium that he created for about $350 million. Uh, the guy next with the black hair, the black curly hair, I met him when he was 15 years old. He lived close to my house. He sent me an email one day. He says, I like Linux. Could we talk about this? You know, can we talk about Linux? I said, sure, we could have beer and pizza. And he goes, well, I could have the pizza, but I can't have the beer because I'm only 15. So we got together and we talked for a while. And he had already done every course he could at his progressive high school in my house. He had, in effect, graduated, but he couldn't go to university because he was too young. And so his father gave him a job for writing device drivers for him and paying $40,000 a year to do that. To make a long story short, he eventually became a network systems administrator for a small college in Massachusetts. And he captured two guys trying to break into their network, held, tied them up at a honey, on a honeypot until the FBI could arrest them in Italy. This gave him some notoriety and got him a two-page spread in Business Week magazine. He wasn't yet 18. So eventually he 
met the guy who did this first special effects for Star Wars and helped him with additional special effects in Star Wars. And then he went out to Portland, met this really nice young lady, joined a commune for a while, and was doing PhD level work at the University of Washington. He never graduated from high school, never officially graduated from high school. And um, I actually performed this wedding ceremony. The guy in the lower right hand corner, he created his first distribution at the age of 15. It was the first distribution he could actually install into the FAT file system. He called it FAT Linux, P H E T. He had 20,000 customers before his, father, before his parents found out what he was doing. And when his father said, Why didn't you? tell us what you were doing he said to him, well i didn't really need your help he came to the uh a linux expo in, in california and i met him i digital had a big booth there and you know he came in of course i knew him already and his father was just looking around at all these huge booths and then he had his little booth 10 by 10 over in the corner and I said to his father, you really didn't know. You, did, you still don't know what he did, did you? His father goes, I guess not. And then finally, the guy in the right hand, in the left hand corner at the bottom, is a person I met in Soweto, uh, South Africa. Soweto is a city of about 500,000 people. That's north of Johannesburg. They're mostly black. They, before apartheid, they were the ones who would be hired to do uh, menial tasks for the white people in Johannesburg. Um, when I went to Soweto, I was there at the uh, invitation of a person from government, a black man that I met at the, at the conference. And he, as we were going around, I said to him, Soweto would be a perfect place for Wi-Fi, because it's kind of a bowl, and you could bring Wi-Fi in here really easy. He said, these people wouldn't know what to do with Wi-Fi. And I said, well, you know, you could also help them with Linux. They could create jobs with Linux. He said, no, no, no. He says, these people barely know what a, what a PC is. He said, they, they don't even know about Linux. So he took me to the airport. I flew home. But he did go and talk to his boss about what I had said. And his boss said, well, let's go and see what's going on. So they set up a meeting in Soweto, and 350 people came to the meeting. And the meeting was about open source. And at the end of the meeting, these three black guys, young guys, up front were arguing about something. And they said, what are you arguing about? And one of the other guys pointed to him and said, this guy is running a software support service out of his house with dial-up network because we can't get real internet here. And he is helping Linus Torvalds debug a problem with the AMD memory management system. And this so blew away the government guys that they opened up an open source development system in a way And when I went back the following year to another Linux world, they invited me once again to come to Soweto to the opening of this software center. And as the as the manager of the group finished the opening, he came over to me and looked down at me and said, you have no idea what your words that day meant. Hmm. So then we're starting up Project Kawa. I started working on Project Cal One about 12 years ago. The concept was to use thin clients and server systems in the tall buildings of Latin America. Um, most people think of Sao Paulo, and you know, if they think of it at all, they think of it in terms of the Brazilian rainforest or soccer or carnival. But they don't think about the fact that Sao Paulo is the second largest city in the Western Hemisphere after only Mexico City, with New York and Los Angeles being far down the pipe. They don't think about the fact that Sao Paulo has about 12 times the density 
of New York, of Manhattan. And so we wanted to put little thin clients, maybe using 10 watts in place of a whole bunch of PCs and you know stuff that would use 350 watts 400 watts or whatever and then server systems down in the basement that would actually do the processing and um, we still have that as a project we're still moving forward although very slowly and we want to set this up so that people can actually have jobs providing the support for these type of systems and we wanted, we're focusing right now on university students who need money to go to university. In Latin America, a lot of the state and federal universities are free of charge, free of tuition. But about 40% of the students who are qualified to go still can't go because their parents are too poor to buy the apartment or the uh, pay the transportation, the internet, the computer, the books and stuff. And so the students have to turn down the free tuition. By doing Project Kawa part-time, they make enough money to be able to take advantage of their education. And so we're creating a, a pilot of this right now. Uh, in Argentina, we have about 100 students who want to do this. And some more students in Sao Paulo and in uh, Rio de Janeiro. And if it works out there, I would like to bring it to some other third world countries like Detroit. And <laughs> there's also a big thing about the amount of power utilization because this would reduce the amount of power used by computers considerably. So that's Project Kawa, and uh, that's also the end of my talk. And we can now go back if I can figure out how to end this. Oh, there we go. I'll stop this. Maybe, maybe I can. Oh, there we go. There he is. <laughs> so, if you guys have any questions or whatever, or if you just want to talk, that's fine too. Well, uh, you if you want to, uh, <laughs> you, you've certainly uh, uh, been an important part <laughs> of, uh, of of Linux and Unix and computing in general. And uh, uh, boy, we sure appreciate all that. Yeah, thank you. Well, the thing is. I, I point out to people that I am one part. I am part of a community. Um, I have jobs, and I simply try to do the, the right thing at a particular time. Sure. Um, I tell people that if they want to see the most important person in free software, when they get up in the morning, they should look in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And I think that everybody has a part of it. I mean, I used to be a beekeeper, and I've also studied ants and stuff like that. And I, and I know that these insects work at doing their specific thing. So that the bee takes a little bit of wax, pinches it, puts it together, and eventually the honeycomb forms. But there is no one architect of that whole thing, not even a queen bee. She's just another insect in the in the hive. A very important one, but just another insect. And so the same type of thing is with free software. And you know, I encourage people to try and create their own business. If if if, if free software is one thing, it's an accelerator. It allows you to start a business without having to have a huge amount of capital, without having to, you know, you can pick these different pieces of software, put them together, create a prototype, and then go out and, you know, maybe get a little bit of money or investment for that prototype and start to put it together. And I think in today's, particularly in today's market, 
with the viruses, with the economy the way it is, with the number of people being laid off, I would like to see lots of little companies start up instead of one gigantic company. Mm -hmm. we, we don't need any more Bezos. Okay. <laughs> what we need is a bunch of little companies who provide jobs, who innovate quickly, and stuff like that. Sure. It's, it's interesting. If you measure intellectual property by copyright and patents, 86% of intellectual property comes from small and medium business. Only 14% comes from the large companies. Wow. Now, even Apple, what Apple does is they buy things they see. People go to Apple and say, hey, look what I've done. Would you like to buy that? Oh, yeah, well, happy to buy that phone. But if you measure it by copyright and by patents, it's only for, you know, large companies only do 14%. Hmm. Gib, you have a question? Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously I've been a Linux supporter and uh, enthusiast for decades now. And, you know, I've tried helping out where I can. I'd just be interested in your perspective in uh, what can we do to help Linux? What is it, you know, if, if we as individuals might have an interest in doing something to further the cause, what types of things would you perceive that we could uh, to do? Well, uh, a lot of that depends on where you are, okay? So I happen to mention Detroit. There's, um, I think there's a lot of work that could be done in Detroit to reinvent the city in more of a, of a technological you know, city, using free software and open hardware so that you create products. One of the things I talk about, you know, there's th th an amazing amount of stuff that people don't, I, I don't think people don't really think about, okay? So I tell people that nobody really buys computers. Nobody even really buys software, okay? They're buying a solution to a problem. And once you get people started thinking like that, all of a sudden they realize it doesn't really make a difference whether it's closed source or open source or whatever, as long as the, as the problem is solved. And even if that problem is playing a game, if you could solve that problem by using two tin cans and a string to play the game, you would. And, you know, when you start thinking that way, then the difference is now where open source comes in or free software comes in, is when you try and take all these parts of software and put them together and make them work together. And the problem is if they're closed, you can't change the software pieces to make them work together well. If they're open or free software, you can change one or the other to get them to work together and then use them. So, this is one reason why, you know, and I've looked at I've looked at software packages like SAP or PeopleSoft or stuff like that, and they have all the functionality there, but you have to pay so much money for it. It uses such a large computer system to do it, when in reality you only need some small piece of that functionality to be able to solve the problem. You so do you really need to spend $500,000 for Oracle? Or could you actually solve the problem with Postgres uh, or, or MySQL or some other free software you know, database? Or maybe you don't even need a whole database, maybe just a data structure, you know, like linked lists or hash tables or stuff like that. That might be enough. And that a whole relational database or object oriented database is too much overhead for what you need. Um, so, trying to get 
students and young software developers to think like that. And the other thing is that a lot of software, a lot of young tech people are very good at the tech part, but they actually have no idea at all about how to do the business. And one of the things that Project Kawa is about is helping them set up a very small business that basically all the businesses do the same thing, but they do it in a geographic area so that you can you can do this like cookie cutters. You give them a, a, a skeleton contract, you give them skeleton advertising materials, you give them a couple of products that they can sell, and you say to them, study these products, study how to sell them, and now just take the advertising material, take the contracts, and go out and sell them. Sell them to small business people. So you guys have all been to McDonald's or the store, and you've seen point-of-sale terminals sitting there that have a scanner and a scale and you know all that stuff. Do you know how much those point-of-sale terminals cost? Like $3,000 a piece. And the worst part of it is that once you start using them, you're locked in to the software that they have. And if you need to change anything, you have to pay a lot of money to them. Compare that to some software called Udo, which allows you to set up a point of sale terminal and an ERP system. It's all free software, and you can put it on a Raspberry Pi, mount the Raspberry Pi on the back of an LCD panel, and you know, plug in your USB scale, your USB cache drawer, stuff like all the software already exists, it already runs. And then sell this as a maintaining this for the small stores. So you get to sell them training, you get to sell them maintenance on it, and they save a lot of money from having to pay the $3,000 up front for each one. I knew a guy, he has a restaurant in Nashua, New Hampshire, and one day I, I ran into him and he said he was exhausted because he spent an entire day out of the month typing in his receipts that he got from his suppliers. I go, well, why don't you just feed that into the system, right? I mean, don't you get these receipts? Can't you get these receipts electronically? So they mail them to me electronically. I says, well, I could write a said script to take out all the formatting information and we could just feed this right into the database. He says, you can't because the company that sold me the system won't sell me, won't tell me how to do that. I have to buy a $30,000 piece of software <laughs> to do that. And so one of the things that Project Kawa is going to do is going to help these students sell window sale terminals and provide first line of support for that. There are companies in Latin America and in the United States that sell second and third level support. And all the students have to do is provide the first level support. And that's gonna be one of their jobs. Ryan, you had a question? Yeah, I did. Uh, Thanks again, John, for uh, the presentation. This has been really great so far. So thank, um, thank you again for that. Um, my question was actually about uh, this project, Kawa, that you've mentioned a couple times now. Um, and you may have actually already just sort of answered my question more or less. Um, and I think in your presentation toward the end, you mentioned what seemed like kind of some of the more like longer term uh, goals and directions for that project. But I was just a little yes. bit curious about um, kind of what that project looked like in the more like uh, near future, kind of like what the plans were in, in the more immediate uh, future for that and what was going on. So Project Kawa is actually, or has been actually tied to another project that's happening in Latin America. Um, this project, the other side of this project is that the Raspberry Pi, which costs $35 in the United States, 
by the time you buy it on the street in Brazil, it costs $150. That's because it happens like this. A $35 Raspberry Pi costs $20 to ship to Brazil with $5 of insurance. That's $60 on the receipt. It hits customs going into Brazil and they hit it with 100% tax. So now it's $120 for the $35 Raspberry Pi. Then if it's going to a store to be sold to an end user customer, well, the store has to make a profit. And so now it's $150. And to people whose GDP is two thirds of what ours is, it's like it's two hundred dollars. Yeah. So if you give a thirty-five dollar Raspberry Pi to a high school student and they burn it up or destroy it, you go, be more careful next time. Here's another one. But when it's two hundred dollars, it's not as quite as easy. Sure. And so what we wanted to do originally was just to manufacture Raspberry Pis in Brazil because the secret is that if you do the manufacturing in Brazil, you put the parts onto the printed circuit board in Brazil, then the taxes on the parts is 16%, not 100. And if you there are certain parts that aren't taxed at all. So if there's no companies in Brazil that's capable of making those parts, there's no taxes on them when they come in. That's the no tax on the on the SOC, no tax on the RAM, no tax on da, 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 da. So we would be able to reduce the cost of these boards dramatically, at the same time giving jobs to Brazilians. Uh, and then, in addition to all of that, there came the concept of, well, why not design and manufacture these little computers in Brazil? Come up with a better Raspberry Pi. Believe me, there's lots of stuff that's wrong with the Raspberry Pi. Um, so we've been working on that project for several years. The Doing the thin clients and the server systems was a great idea. However, to go from the basement, to get the signals from the basement server systems up to the apartments or up to the offices, meant you typically had to put in wiring or some type of networking. And if you're putting that into an old building, if you're putting it into a new building, it's easy. You just tell the architect, you know, create the wire raise and stuff, and put it in. And then they build the building, and that takes about two years. If you're putting it into an old building, it's harder to put in that network. And it was just recently that I figured out how to do that. And it became so easy that we can actually move forward with that now. I'll tell you in a moment what the, what the solution was. Um, so because of this, I took that first Project Kawa design, the thin clients, the servers and stuff, and I kind of moved that aside and then we, we decided to concentrate on students, and we decided to concentrate on part-time jobs for them so they could go to university. And so then we started creating some small projects, small products that would use these little computers. And then so finally, uh, we came up with a completely surface-oriented business that would need no hardware. We could even have the students repair Windows systems and Apple systems. That's fine. But, you know, be able to afford university that way. Um, but now the little computers are almost on the verge of being able to be produced. So we want to go back to that model. And uh, and we have 100 students in Argentina, Buenos Aires, Argentina. We have a, a university that's very that's bought into this. They say this is a great thing both for the students, for the university, for the small business people. We have a couple of universities in Brazil that are doing this. And so we want to start this pilot, get this going, show people it can be done, show people, you know, get the students involved. And when we get the students be successful at this, 
then the students that are already there become the mentors of the next students coming in. So one of the things we need are mentors because you guys may remember when you were doing your first sale or going for your first job and your knees were shaking together and you, you said, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I really don't know what I'm doing. But there was that one person who may have helped you. That was your mentor. And what we could what we could use are mentors to work with these students and help them through this knock. It's interesting. A lot of these kids in Latin America have been taking care of their families' computers since the age of eight. They know how to put in a new disk drive. They know how to install a new operating system. They know how to put in patches. They know how to do, you know, set up wire Wi-Fi. They know how to do all this stuff, or they know how to go to the internet and find out how to do it. But if you ask them, what do you know? They go, I don't know anything. <laughs> really? You don't know anything. Do you know your, do you think your parents know how to do this? Oh no, they don't know. Well, then you know something. So it's the mentor that can get them to understand and work through this with them. We have another little trick. Uh, the other little trick is that <coughs> we have the mentor go out to the Rotary Club, to the Small Business Association, to the user group meeting, and talk with people who are in business and say, would you like to hire one of these young people? you know, to help you run your business. And if they say yes, then they can become a mentor of this. And when, when, when you talk with somebody like the Rotary Club, you know, group of small business people, you say anybody to be willing to, to, to help with this program, raise your hands, I'll get your name, your address, your telephone number. And when these kids go out to do their first sale, we will send them to you first. And you listen to them, you sign the contract, you agree to hire their services, and then they've made that first sale. In Magic Axe, this is called forcing the card. Right? You force the card, you're the magician, you force the card on the person, and then they accept it. So we ask the mentors to be the magicians to go out and talk to these organizations. We're also going out to uh, university uh, alumni associations. We're going to the employment offices at the universities and say, you know, make this part of your financial aid office. To say to the students, if you want to work part-time, rather than flipping hamburgers at McDonald's or being a night clerk at a hotel or any of these other jobs, you're actually doing work in computer science and computer engineering. That is what you want to go into for a living. And after you graduate, you can make a decision. You, you now have five or six customers. They're your customers. They're your business. You can either expand that business and keep going, or maybe you want to do something else. And if you want to do something else, you can sell your business to an incoming freshman and say to them, you take over giving the support that I'm already doing for these people. And you could even walk away with a little bit of money from that to help you start your next business. So, you know, Project Kawan, what Project Kawan does is teach the students the business aspects of things, things like doing subcontracting. You don't know how to do something, but maybe somebody else does. It's not in your contract with your customer. This is something your customer wants to do this above and beyond the contract. So you subcontract to somebody else and the customer pays you extra money outside of your contract to get this work done that they want to get done. This is what subcontracting means. This is how you do it. Go do it.
we talk, there's, there's a lot of companies out there that do support over the internet. And every once in a while, they have somebody call them up, a shop owner calls them up and says, my computer's not working. They go, okay, tell us what's wrong. Oh, it's not working. Okay. And after about six or seven hours on the phone with it's not working, they hop in their car and they drive for three or four hours to get to the customer site and they find out their mouse is unplugged. <laughs> and if they just had one of these students who was relatively close, who could walk over to the customer site and see what's wrong and then talk with the guy on the, on the, mm -hmm. on the telephone, it might cut that six or seven hours down to 30 minutes. And so I have a lot of people say, hey, you know, these support companies, they, they, they would, don't want to see this. I've, I've gone to talk to support companies and say, bring it on, bring it on. We would love to have this. Well, yeah, it's the difference between low hanging fruit, honestly. It's like you got someone who can do the really easy stuff. You don't have to worry about sending a tech out for four hours. Exactly. Boots on the ground, right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. these guys, these guys, who would do who've been doing this frontline work over the telephone they get to now move up to what we call the deck seven second level support you know that all the little stuff is and and because this is not a, this is not a break and fix contract a break and fix contract something breaks and you you go out to fix it this is more of a continual service contract that every week the student shows up, they look at your error logs, they check to see if you have disk space, they see that all the patches are applied, and so forth and so on. And they they try and make sure that your system does not break. Um, we have lots of examples of customers who, one guy had gotten a brand new computer and he was just complaining about how slow it was. And so this kid went in to look at it and said, well, whoever gave you this computer, all they did was install the bare OEM operating system. They did install all the device drivers that were special for the hardware. And so the main CPU was doing all of the work, right? The GPU was not even working because the driver for the GPU had not been put in there. The CPU was basically painting every pixel on the screen. Um, the DMA work, it was all, it was all, you know, the main CPU was doing everything. And so he installed all the device, proper device drivers and the whole system came to life. You know, it was just, it was like a brand new system and his customer was just like so happy. So this is the type of stuff that these kids could do, but you know they need the confidence and, and the knowledge of how to sell themselves, and that's what we're doing with Budget Cowan. That's awesome. That's very cool. And like I said, once we get this working, and you know we have some proof points and stuff like that, then I'd be happy. You know, so we we built the project webs the Project Cowan website in three layers. The topmost layer is a description of the product project itself, how it works, what we're trying to do. And then the second layer is by country by country, culture by culture, language by language. So we have one section for the United States, one section for Brazil, one section for France or whatever. And that's because employment laws and contracts and legal stuff tend to be on a country by country basis. Mm -hmm. So you need to have different countries and to a certain extent, different languages. And then below that, for each country, we have smaller sections, which are might, by, might be a city or in something like Sao, Sao Paulo would be three or four sections because Sao Paulo is a big city. And this would be for the mentor. This would be under the mentor's control. Um, and be working with the different groups, the different uh, what we call project hour professionals inside of that area. 
So it's it's really a, a, a pyramid, but unlike most pyramid schemes, it, it, it stops at that level. It doesn't try and go <laughs> than that. And uh, and what we're looking for is mentors who can go in there. So once we get it working and we can demonstrate that, then we'll reach out to more and more potential mentors. And like I said, in a lot of cases, the successful students can become the mentors of the new students coming in. So that's where that's what we're doing. I did show this plan one time to a couple of financiers in Brazil, and after they read it and understood it, they looked at me and they said, "You know, this could scale very large." And I said, "Yes, I know." So I would like to have you know, 10 or 15 million Project Tower professionals around the world. But what I don't want is I don't want one company to have 10 or 15 million employees. What I want is 10 or 15 million companies to each have one or two employees. And so when people do the work that they're doing, the money goes into their pocket not into somebody else's pocket. That's what I want. Because if you have one company that has that many employees, you're going to find out that the government gets very nervous about it. That company has a lot of political power that most politicians don't want to see. Very neat stuff, John. Um, I think we're we're kind of coming near the end of our uh, a lot of time here. A um, okay. couple things I wanted to say. First of all, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I, I've been wanting to get you. I talked to you a couple of years ago about you coming to Detroit, and um, I, I was uh, I, I wanted to figure out a way to get you here. Uh, unfortunately, we had this um, this little virus get in the way, so. Uh, we didn't get to get you here physically, but it opened up a huge opportunity for us to get you here virtually, and that's uh, so it's, it's been great. Uh, normally, when we have speakers, uh, we would take them out to dinner afterwards. We would uh, make sure they're well fed and have plenty of beer to drink. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do that this time. We haven't been able to since February is the last time we did that. Um, however, I do know that you've got your birthday challenge fundraiser. Um, that is actually over now. It's oh, we, we can't uh, pitch the money into it. I don't think so. Okay, well I, we've, uh, we've earmarked a hundred bucks. Uh, well, it, it would be the money that we would uh, we would have spent on buying you dinner, and since we haven't bought any dinner for anybody in the last five months or so, we, we kind of figured we could we could spring it this time. So so maybe if you let me know uh, how I can how I can apply that to something. Well, I tell you what, I mean, you can still uh, donate that money directly to the Free Software Foundation. Okay. And just because just because it was going in yeah, under sure, my fundraiser, sure. right? I, don't, yeah, I really don't I was, care, right? I was looking to help help you close out your fundraiser, but it sounds like you did it without my help um, or without well, our help. Well, when you set it up, you set up for a certain span sure. of time, and I know that yesterday I looked and it said there was only five hours left of the fundraiser, so I assume that they have closed it out, and they are going to now give the money to the Free Software Foundation. Okay, cool. So we can we can uh, we can go directly to Free Software Foundation. You could do that, or you could contribute it to Debian, or you know, one of the uh, other Free you Software know, projects. You offline, or, you can, or you could donate it to the Linux Terminal Server Project. Nah, uh, we for whatever, uh, for whatever they need. Well, let's. Uh, th this is about you. Let's uh, let's let's figure out a way to uh, help out one of your charities. Um, so we're happy to do that. Um, you and I can talk offline. We can we can figure out the details of how to make that happen. Uh, uh, we are uh, we're in your debt, I think. For, uh, for well, the other thing is money. when um, when this pandemic is over, and I'm hoping that we find a vaccine that's effective sure. um, in the in the January February timeframe. Um, 
I'm going to be getting, uh, I hopefully will be getting Guru, my husband, to come up from Brazil. And he's going to be working up here with me. But I would like him to see some parts of the country, and I'd be happy to come to Detroit. Well, um, and I would really like to talk with some of your civic leaders, because by that time, sure. we should have Kawa really working. Sure, sure. Really, really have a proof, proof points and stuff. And uh, I would really like to see it. Cause... So very close to my house is a place called Lowell, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever heard of it before. Oh, yeah. Well, Lowell was the first place in the United States to act as an industrial city. And then it went downhill, and they had a lot of uh, empty mill buildings and stuff. But they reinvented it into a tech city, and now it's vibrant again. Mm -hmm. So I, I would like to see the same thing happen to Detroit. You know? And sure. I think the free software would be an excellent way of doing that. Sure, sure. Well, uh, it, we <laughs> Detroit has... Uh, has one of the largest collections of uh, engineers in the world with the automotive industries. Uh, I know. People around here, they, they get tech, right? Yeah. But they get tech, but what you need is you need, you need a plan. You need a business sure. plan to be able to help you, you know, come up with the idea, develop the, the process of manufacturing and stuff and, and getting it out there. And I think that free software and free culture is the way of helping people get started with that. Sure. And and then and I'm a great believer in the cooperative, right? The cooperative mm -hmm. style of companies so that the employees own the company. There's not some big boss up there that owns it. Sure. There's a bunch of stockholders here. That, that you know. And actually, if employees had owned the automotive, the automotive industry, Detroit might never have gone downhill the way it had. Hmm. Because employees would not have voted to move the manufacturing overseas. Sure. Right. Sure. Sure. Well, we still have some manufacturing here. It's not certainly not, not the scale that it used to be. Right. I did see one question on here. Uh, Gemini asked this question. Gemini, do you want to ask the question yourself? I turned my uh, chat on. Yeah, so. that's right. Go ahead, yeah, Gemini. I just wanted to find out how do we um, register to help with uh, Project Kawa. I was looking at the website, and there does not seem a way for us right. to register. So, like I said, we've we've gone through this cycle of Project Kawa several times, and we're about to start it up again. I'm about to reach out for some funding to make the website into what I want to see it. And at that point, we will also uh, set up a thing for people to volunteer in a specific way. So, right now, um, if you just go to the watch the videos and stuff like that at the top. You know, explaining why Project Cow would be good for students, why it would be good for mentors, why it would be good for customers. Um, we hope to get this funding started within a month's time. And with that time, we would open it up. And the other thing about Project Cow One is nothing is closed about it. So every single piece of Project Cow will be completely open. And you would be able to use the facilities of Project Kawa. You'd be able to read them, even without logging in, even without reading a login. Now, if you want to talk to people, if you want to ask questions, we ask you to create a login. We also ask you to belong to or, or to agree to a code of conduct. Because we don't want people on there to be bullied. We don't want people on there to feel uncomfortable. We don't want people to, you know. So basically, you, we're asking you to be a civil human being. I know that's hard to believe, but we're asking you to be that. And when you do that, then you can have a login, you can ask questions, you can uh, to do that. The next stage is where we ask you not only to believe in a code of conduct, but also a code of professionalism. 
And if you agree to say, well, I'm only going to have a certain number of customers. If I'm, I'm only, you know, I'm always going to show up on time. I'm always going to do these various things. To act like a professional. Then you'll be able to use the Project Kawa um, icons, symbols, Project Kawa logos and stuff on your system. And we would, you know, we would ask that you get certified by some type of certification agency, maybe LPI, maybe another one, in order to increase your knowledge and stuff in there to be to become more professional about this. Uh, none of these will require any money being paid to Project Kawan. Project Kawan has its own way of making money through sponsorships and a bunch of other stuff. But what they will do is create a sense of professionalism out of, you know, the, the people that are, that are using the name. And so, you know, if you understand all of this, then you could become a, a mentor, particularly on that uppermost level, the Project Kawa uh, professional level. So, you know, hang on for a couple months, and as we get this stuff set up, I'll be happy to send out the information to your group. Great. Well, I mean, you can send that directly to me if you'd like. I, I can make sure it gets uh, distributed properly. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, about seven minutes to nine. Uh, John, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming. Yes, thank uh, you very much. Uh, I appreciate I, you guys. I, yes. Hours of your time. And uh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to uh, when I can travel through New Hampshire again sometime and stop and we'll, we'll have another fine meal. Well, and I hope that uh, I don't think you've ever met Buku. No. Well, I'd like you. I'd like you to meet him and him to meet you. Yeah, that would be great. We do have tended to an afterglow. Um, so it, the meeting, quote unquote, ends at around nine o'clock, and then we go to our dinner, quote unquote. But since we don't have dinner time, if you if you like to stick around, please feel free. I'm going to duck downstairs and turn the streaming and all that other stuff off. So. Everyone who's watching via the stream, thank you very much. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next month. So thank, thank you, everyone. Thanks, thank you. Well, thanks again, John. I really enjoyed it tonight. Thanks. And I want to tell you, when you offered to come to Detroit, that's recorded. We, we've got that. Uh, if, this, if, this we're gonna hold you to it. if this virus is ever solved, uh, we're going to hold you to your word, uh, I guarantee you. Well, well whatever you said we could do that. <laughs> well, a lot of people ask me from time to time, do you you know, you said this? Do you do you do you stand behind that? And I tell them I stand behind everything I say. You know. Well, that, thank you very much for the offer. We appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, John. Uh,